Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Holly Misselbauer. For those of you who don't know me, um, Kate is uh, on leave, much deserved leave, and um, she asked me to step in for her. So um, that's what I'm doing. Um, so um, I don't believe. Uh, I don't believe that anyone reported anyone new on the teams, um, but if there is someone, um, if there is someone new, if you want to speak up now, that would be great. Uh, if you want to introduce somebody on one of your teams, um, because I don't think I saw uh, any news, any new, the word new posted anywhere. Let's see here. Okay, so is anybody on the call new or do you have someone you want to introduce? Okay. Okay. Um, so these are um, the links that have been provided before to everyone. Um, the milestones uh, last Friday was the final final freeze date. We had several freeze dates. And then um, we have uh, this Friday is when the Q4 manual test environment should be ready. Um, and I pasted in here a URL based on the one that we use for, for Q3. I assumed it's going to be the same for Q4, except it's going to have a four in there. Um, and then January 11th, uh, is the end of the manual testing and the fixing of the critical bugs. Um, we have three weeks uh, because of the holiday. Um, people are going to be uh, out and in and whatever. So we have uh, more time available this time. And then January 14th is when Q4 is final. Um, so you can read more details about the uh, milestones uh, if you click on the link here. Uh, but I just I would share those um, dates. Uh, so then the next few screens have the sprint highlights. Um, the ones in red are the ones that are from the last um, sprint that haven't been updated or perhaps um, have been updated, but were not changed from red to black. So um, I can't tell you if they were actually updated or not, um, but you have the link to the um, slide deck so you can change it now if you um, are aware of any changes. So you can kind of look through this at your leisure to see what people have been working on. Um, we have an update here from the ERM teams. Um, okay, a lot of people working on this project. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump to the to the demos. Um, first, we're going to start with the uh, acquisitions dev team. Um, so I guess uh, I should stop sharing and let. Uh, I don't know who is going to present first or what you're going to do, but I'll just stop sharing and then you can take it over. How does that sound? So we have. Uh, is this. Alexi, is that how you say that, Arvin? Okay, nobody's saying anything. Are, are you there? Yeah, uh, you're correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and I'll stop sharing and then you can start sharing. And is, is Dennis on yet? Just got here, yes. Okay, so we're already up to demos, Dennis. Oh, really? Yes, and acquisitions is first. OK. Um, yeah, we're moving right ahead. <laughs> so do you want to give a little intro, and then we can turn it over to Arvind? Uh, yeah, just give us a quick minute here, because Arvind was joining me in my office so that we can uh, 
Have Should we jump to the now. next? We can jump to the next person and come back to you. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. And Anne Marie, you. that would be you. Hey, and I'm already unmuted. Um, Perfect. So, all right, I'm going to change hats. Now I have my data import hat on. Um, so, uh, Folajet has been working on stories in the last few sprints that are um, a, a lot of the work has been around the file upload component so that um, files can be uploaded and either attached to other records or in our case we're going to upload them and then break them apart so that we can store the data and work with the data to create or update other types of records in folio um, Last time we demonstrated kind of the main functionality of file upload. And then this couple of sprints, we have been working on the um, uh, refinements to that. So some of the error handling and exception handling. Our goal is to uh, finish that work and have the front end and back end documentation ready for Stripes Force to pick up and start working on turning it into a general component that any of the um, folio apps can use for uploading files. And hopefully that work's going to start in January over in Stripes Force, depending on what their priorities are. So that's a little intro. And hopefully Victor is on and can share at this, right, point. this point. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Please tell me if you see it. Yep. Great. So uh, the first one, uh, this is a UI data import application and now oh, we... Victor, hey, I forgot to disclose. Um, and so we're demonstrating from Victor's machine instead of from folio testing or folio snapshot because we needed some sample data to play with to, to set up some scenarios that we didn't have up on the um, the public environments. Okay. Yep. And now I'm going to uh, upload uh, several f uh, files, records, mark records, and uh, he here is the case when we have different file extensions. And uh, in that case, uh, we show a model uh, window uh, which says uh, that we can. Uh, it is not allowed to upload files with different extensions, so let's try uh, choose files with, uh, with exactly the same extension and proceed to the next screen. And here you see that we have the uploading UI, and now we uh, should uh, see the uploading uh, which is going to complete one by one, and after that we can see the uploaded file uh, UI. Uh, with which we can interact in just a minute. And so while it's uploading, um, we have implemented the uh, restriction on mixing file types by file extension as part of data import. Uh, the way the component is built, you don't have to implement that restriction. So if you wanted to allow a JPEG and a PDF to upload at the same time, you could. And um, this is also configurable, of course, and uh, other applications may not need uh, this feature. And uh, uh, here we can see that we uh, actually can remove files. And uh, in that case, uh, we are able to undo uh, that uh, functionality. But in case if we are sure that we want to remove files, we can click the undo and uh, the file should be deleted in uh, 10 seconds. And of course we can uh, specify other uh, timeouts for deleting the file. As you can see now the file is deleted. De 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 and uh, the last thing which I want to demonstrate is about uh, uh, error handling. Well, imagine the situation uh, uh, when we, for some reason, have an error when we try to register all the files on the server, and uh, this is done by uh, initial um, post request to the server with uh, file metadata meta information which needed to the server, 
and uh, in this case and also if uh, any files for some reasons um, is uh, failed to abort we demonstrate exactly the same ui let's look at it and i let's try to pick three files and in that case we can see that uh, the files have the corresponding ui and uh, the uh, deleting feature for that uh, will be uh, uh, handled in the further stories and probably that's it which i wanted to demonstrate today thank you any questions Um, where are where are these uh, files persisted? The ones that are uploaded. Where are they posted? Persisted, like where are they stored? Ah, they stored on the server. So this is just uh, files uh, which uh, we get from the file system, yeah, and uh, post them uh, to the server, and uh, and they process the. Uh, all the work about proce processing them in uh, is making on the server. Yeah, Victor is right. Uh, so now uh, we have the first implementation uh, for file storage and they are stored uh, in the local file system of the server. But uh, in the future, we also will uh, add support for cloud storage as well. <laughs> And I had a question in chat from somebody that might be good for the group. Um, is there any protection against uploading the same file twice? Oh. Uh, since uh, each file uh, is uploaded uh, in a separate, uh, let's say, we, we call it job execution, yeah, that uh, each single file is a new job execution and we do not uh, take into account the file name. Yes, yeah, so technically you could uh, upload uh, the same file many times. Right, so um, so right now for for the component that we've set up in data import, there's nothing that would stop you. If that's something that needs to happen in general, then that may be something Stripes Force needs to take a look at when they turn it into a general component. Yep. But uh, for data import, we do have other alerts that would start to kick in if uh, down the road, if you started trying to um, create a, a second copy of an order or a second copy of, a, of an instance. We just haven't gotten there yet because we got to get the files uploaded. Okay, thank you, Anne Marie and Victor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenters are. Uh, let's go back to acquisitions. Uh, Dennis, are you ready? Sure thing. Yeah, good to go. Okay, uh, you want to go ahead and share your screen then. Uh, so Arvind yeah. is actually going to share his screen. Okay. Um, but. I just want to do a quick intro first because we, we originally planned for actually sort of a two part demo. We wanted to show a handful of actually exciting functionality from the orders module that relates to creating purchase orders uh, and editing and updating purchase orders, purchase order lines. Um, so that portion of the demo, unfortunately we're gonna have to push forward. There are a handful of modules involved there and a few critical issues that we couldn't seem to get resolved altogether in one environment in preparation for this morning. Um, so we're, we're hoping or we're looking forward to doing a, a really exciting demo for orders the next time we all get together. But we also wanted to showcase a few enhancements from the vendor module. And there are a number of bug fixes that have gone into vendors, but we wanted to highlight something that is, we think, maybe something of interest to the community. Um, and there's more functionality that's going to be added to this sort of feature set moving forward that uh, I think will be exciting for other applications potentially. So we'll start by just showcasing that stuff. It's the phone number uh, that has been sort of cleaned up 
in order to make it a little more consistent with other applications and also based on some of the feedback we got from international uh, users. Uh, so we've cleaned up the phone number field into one field as you can see here. There's now a type for phone number and this is the vendor contact information. So these are phone numbers that relate to the vendor itself. Um, and so as we can see, Arvin is going through adding a couple of phone numbers here, selecting the type, language and categories. And below, we have contact people. So a vendor can have multiple contact people. And something that was addressed in our user acceptance testing for vendors was that a contact person may have multiple phone numbers as well. And those phone numbers may, may be in part the vendor phone numbers. They may also be additional phone numbers, uh, like a cell phone for a specific person and so on, that isn't necessarily a you know, vendor contact information. So we've added the ability to have multiple phone numbers for a contact person. And we're expanding out the functionality of this contact people. So you can see now there's a primary phone number and Arvin's populating that primary phone number now. And there are also additional phone numbers that you can add for uh, a contact person. So same format as we saw above, but we can now have multiple phone numbers for for a single contact person. And we could of course have multiple contact people for a vendor. And we can of course have multiple phone numbers for a vendor as well under contact information. I hope that wasn't too quick for you, but a general overview. One of the exciting things we're incorporating into this moving forward that we didn't quite get uh, sorted for this demo is uh, an auto suggest component that, that will help you sort of add phone numbers uh, and we intend to use that in a few different places as well. So look forward to seeing that. And um, if you have any questions, please ask away. Nice to see the progress, no question. Excellent, yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, anything else from acquisitions? Okay, uh, Vega, who is going to be doing the demo? Yep, I'm going to do a first part of demo. Okay, I'm fine. Going to share my screen. Okay, wonderful. Um, Do you see my screen now? Yep. Okay, what I'm going to show you is password management flow. There are a couple of ways how to uh, renew or change a user's password. Uh, first way is to is when I'm an admin user, I'm going to log in and I want some particular user to change uh, his password. Uh, to do this, I need to find this user. Um, edit his profile and click on send reset password email link. Now system resp responded with a pop-up window uh, that contains uh, password reset link and also uh, this user uh, gets an email with, with the, the same link. So I'm going to use this link to do this. I need to log out first. And uh, what I, as a end user, see this uh, screen where I <clears throat> can type my new password. Mm -hmm. uh, 
then click set password and yes it was successful and also there should be another email yep uh, that says uh, that my password has been changed successfully let's try to log in with these new credentials Yep, I was logged in successfully. Uh, a couple of words about link protection. What happens if I'm going to use the same link twice? Let's copy this. Yep, system says my password link has expired. Uh, what happens if I'm going to use some broken link. Let's copy a part of it. In this case, system says that my password link is not valid. Okay, let's log in and uh, I'll show you the second case. If I'm a user and I want to change my password, I need to click a link, change password, and first type my current password. And then type my new password twice. and then click save. Yep, uh, my password uh, successfully changed. Now what happens if I forgot my password? What I need to do? I need to click forgot password link first and uh, type my email, username or phone number. I'm going to use my username and click continue. And in this case, system responds with a email message that contains, <coughs> yep, that contains a link to restore my password. The same screen as in case number one. Again, a couple of words about protection. If I uh, will type something like this, non-existent account, uh, system response, this information uh, wasn't found. If I will try to, to enter the inactive account, system response with the uh, corresponding error. And last case, if I will uh, try email or username that belongs to multiple accounts. Uh, this email ties to multiple uh, accounts. System response with the corresponding error. And the last case I'm going to show you is what happens if I forgot my username. In this case, I need to enter my email or phone number. I go in, I'm going to use my, my email. Click continue and 
there should be a yep, system response with the email that contains my username and use, I can restore my password or login if I remember my password. Basically, that's it. Uh, Alex, can you proceed, please? Fire. Okay. Owen, can you mute yourself? Can you see my screen now? Okay. Yes. Yeah, we can see all. Yep. Mm. Yep. Uh, I'm going to show you password history storage implementation. Um, oh, how can I remove it? Mm. The main idea is uh, to prevent user from uh, changing password to the one that uh, uh, is previously used. Uh, the solution is uh, to create uh, password history storage and uh, save all passwords there while updating. Uh, the default number of uh, password history is 10 and it's configurable. Uh, now I have set it to three uh, to not waste time. Uh, let's check how it works. Um, there is our current password and uh, let's uh, change it three time, incrementing last digit. Uh, we expected uh, we are not allowed uh, to use uh, the current password and uh, two previous ones. Uh, let's uh, try to use the current password. And then we get a message that uh, this password is previously used. Uh, let's try two previous ones. And the same here. Mm. And the same here. Finally, let's uh, change password to the initial one. And, uh, the password is successfully changed. Uh, uh, and finally, let's try to log in with this password uh, to make sure that it's changed. It's changed. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, that's all I wanted to show. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So next on the list, we've got uh, several people from the core team. Uh, are you going to present in this order? Is it did did you going to go first or? Yes, I can go first. Fine. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, go ahead and share your screen. I'm sharing. Okay. Um, hi everyone. So I have a couple of stories to show here. Um, the first one is about uh, displaying the in transit status in the check-in application. Um, but before actually showing the story, I'll show you the demo setup. So first, when we navigate to the settings, organization locations. Select main library. Um, so we have served as two and served as one as a service points associated with the main library. And service two is primary, and service one is associated with the library, but not the primary service point. But for, uh, and for this demo purpose, we also need to have uh, two other service points that are not associated with the location, that is main library. And also, we need a user um, who can check in and check out these items at those service points. So, go to Deco admin. I've made sure that all the four service points are associated with him. 
Um, so yeah, so let's go into the demo. So as you know, items are not always uh, checked in at service point. Service points their locations are assigned to. So whenever this happens, uh, the items go into an in transit status to a service point its eff effective location is assigned to, which basically indicates that the item is not home yet, but is in transit. Um, so for this purpose, let's go to inventory. Uh, and drill down the results by main library. Select 14 cars and so we can see the effective location for this item is main library. So let's use this for the demo. I am selecting the barcode, checking it, checking it out. Items checked out. So as we as we know, service two and service one are the primary service are the service points associated with that location. So that's why I'm switching the service points to the ones which is not associated with that location. Service three in this case, and and I. Check in the item. So you get this model which says that the item is in transit to its home location. And we are routing this item with this barcode to its primary service point, which is served as two. And if you confirm it, it says the book. Book needs to be sent from so and so to served as two and then reshell. So you can see the status here is in transit to served as two. An extension to this uh, setup is where this. So currently, the item is in transit, but we need to check in at its home location so that it's made available. So again, uh, again, so as we know, service two and service one are the service point associated with that library uh, with that location. I'm switching the service point back to service one. Uh, just a second. Uh, right, so service two is primary, so I would go and select service two first and check in this item there. As you can see, the item is available now uh, because it's checked in at its home service point, at its home location. Similarly, when I check out this book again, uh, let me end the session. And switch the service point to Zergdex 1, which is not the primary service point for that location, but it's still associated with that location. The status is still shown as available. And finally, I check this item again. And session, switch the service point back to, for example, served as four, which is not associated with uh, either of them. So let's first check out the item and make sure that it's in transit. And now I would like to check in again at a location, at a service point, which is not associated with any of those. Uh, check in at a service point not associated with the main library. As you can see, you have this in transit again because it's not the home service point. And finally, if I switch back to Service point two, which is the primary service point for that item. You can see it as available. If I go to the users app, faculty, check out the closed loans here. You can see where the check-in has been done. So this is a new field that we have added in this, which is also available in the loan details page. Um, so that's all I had to show. Any questions?
Um, I have a question. If if you had shelving days or shelving minutes assigned at the, at the library where you check it in and it's home, then it, instead of showing available, it would show whatever you chose for your shelving uh, period. Is that correct? Uh, can you repeat that question again? So it, this, uh, it says it's available in the main library, but you can set uh, a period where it's in a, in a status of waiting to be shelved rather That's than turning directly to available. Um, is that, can't you set that as part of the, the desk, as part of the, you know, CERC desk one, you get a, two day lag time or something? Or if that's not part of this, that's fine, I'll. It isn't part of it. Um, the re returned and the flip from that to available that takes the shelving lag time into account. Um, it wasn't part of the story, it's a separate feature. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Emma. Any okay, other? thank you. You have something else? Oh, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, very good. Okay, so next up we have Mikhail. Hi everyone. Um, hi, hi Holly. Hello. Uh, so I just wanted to add uh, to the DTS presentation that it was very nicely done. It's, it's a very complicated, uh, complicated functionality, and a lot of that work was done by Mark, Mike, Mark Johnson on the server side, and it was one of those pieces which, which is pretty complex. So I'm glad that you know it looks like everything is working well. Um, my my presentation here is very short today. It's just one one item really, so it's not very exciting. But um, we we added um, just recently we added this ability to see all the locations associated with the given service points. So you can see that I can switch between different service points here, and uh, the associated locations will be uh, shown here in a read-only mode. Um, you can also see that uh, the primary. Which, which means that um, this service point, point is marked as primary for, for the given location. Um, the same is uh, possible here when you move to the, the edit mode here. You, you should be also see, you should, should also see the same locations here. Um, and that, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Short but sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Zach, you're next. All right, this should be even shorter. <laughs> All right, so I'm just showing the integration between the user's app and requests. So now when we're uh, looking at a user's details, we have an accordion down here for requests. So you can get to open and close requests and also create a new request. So if you click the link, here you see the requests that are affiliated with this user. So the, basically we're taking the user's barcode and then immediately conducting a search uh, to show the requests that are affiliated with a particular user. Likewise, if you wanted to create a new request for a user, you can click the create request button and it will take you straight to the new request page with the, that requester's information already filled in. So all you have to do at that point is scan the item barcode. That's it. Oh, great. That's good. Okay. Um, next up, uh, Matt. Matt Conley. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, hey, Matt. my screen here okay so uh, I'm going to be showing um, the uh, first stage of patron notices which is just the the crudding of them in settings so if I go down to settings and look under circulation we have a new section here for patron notice templates and this behaves pretty much the way you'd expect it to we get a list of the templates in the system and then I can click on one get all the details about it and um, if you're familiar with the staff slips section here, this should look pretty similar. Uh, a lot of the um, setup and uh, functions for previewing notices and such are the same. Um, but uh, I can come back in here and then we have a little more detail in the patron notices. So we've got 
a name description category. Uh, there's a toggle to, to make it active or inactive. And then we have a template down below for an email with a subject line and a body. And uh, we also have various tokens that will be uh, substituted with actual values if you are sending out an actual notice. Um, and we can preview this right from here. And this is just some sample data to, to show what the notice sent out will look like. So we've got title and author and so on filled in. Um, and uh, we can also, of course, edit these. Uh, and there's a second preview button here, which works the same way for that. And we can also create a new notice in the same way. And uh, we have some validation set up on here. We can put in the description, select a category for it, give it an email, Sorry, my keyboard is doing that thing where it adds characters I don't want. And then we can start filling out our notice here and insert. Here we have a list of tokens from uh, different uh, objects in the system. So we've got a lot of details about the item being requested, users, details, and so on, which we can insert as needed. And uh, we also have can insert blocks if we want to put in a list of items and uh, put in the title for each one and so on and so forth. And then that gets added to our list. And we can, if we want to start with one and duplicate it, we have duplicate here. Uh, works as you'd expect. And then you can uh, alter that and get our new notice in there. And of course, we can also delete notices that are no longer needed. Or we should be able to, why is this not deleting? Well, this is one of those things that you <laughs> decided to fail during a demo. Yes, um, of course. It was working before. Uh, anyway, delete usually works. Uh, decided not to today, but that's um, under edit. And we have um, an issue open to try to consolidate some of these different controls under this uh, drop down menu here. So we should be able to access edit and delete here as well. But a little neat work needs to be done in the uh, components to make that, that happen. Um, so basically we have the ability now to create and edit notices for patrons. And um, I don't believe that any of these can actually be sent out at the moment, but that's the next step to make them available either as um, links in the UI, as you saw earlier with the uh, email notices or uh, as automatic uh, actions triggered by certain dates or certain status changes for the items. And that's it for me, I think. Thanks a lot. Okay. So Matt and the others that have been working on the staff slips and the patron notices, th this is one of my favorite parts of Folio. I love it. And it's, I, I can see it kind of following the same structure for having the tokens and designing the notices for when we have to create the purchase orders, the printed purchase orders or the um, PDF purchase orders that go out, or if we have to stack up call numbers into spine labels at some point, it, it's so cool. Thank you. Yeah. And I know for, for fees and fines, we're going to be, uh, implementing the patron notices in Q1. So we'll start using some of the, some of the functionality then. Um, we were just waiting for this part to be done. So uh, you'll start seeing some of it get used. 
Um, Stripes Force, we have John Coburn and uh, Rasmus Volk. Um, who wants to start? Maybe I should stop. I, I'm, I, uh, oh, this is somebody totally different. <laughs> uh, and I added my name to the, to the slide deck, but apparently you. Didn't. Oh, okay. I didn't uh, refresh it. Okay. Um, so I was going to show what we, the work we've been doing on uh, 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 inventory. Uh, oh, there you are. Okay, I see you. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, the MMC has been uh, hard at work uh, uh, speaking out uh, all those uh, uh, pieces of information that they need for, uh, for instances and uh, holding records and, and items in order to, to manage their inventory. Uh, so uh, uh, we've been working on implementing that. It's been a while since uh, uh, you've seen any of that work, I think, because uh, for a while we've been working uh, behind the scenes, uh, updating uh, the backend, uh, both uh, adding to, to these records and also to, uh, to removing uh, uh, stuff that, that was, uh, uh, became obsolete or, 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 or changing stuff that uh, weren't supposed to be structured the way we first uh, uh, thought it was going to be. And, uh, and this work uh, is, uh, especially when you, when you change the APIs, it's uh, uh, every time we, we change an API, we uh, realize that um, uh, more modules have uh, dependencies on an inventory. Uh, so, uh, so inventory sort of sits there in the middle and a lot of modules uh, are using the APIs and, and need to be uh, at least notified, but maybe even changed when when an API changes. So I think it's about uh, eight or or ten modules by now that we we need to consider when whenever we change things in inventory in a in a way that breaks. Uh, but uh, fortunately, most of uh, the changes are uh, are not uh, breaking changes, but but uh, additions. Um, so uh, if we start with the uh, instance. Um, I can show you instance. The instance record uh, didn't change all that much. Liz, you're not showing your screen. If you... Oh, yeah. sorry. Thanks. Well, I haven't been showing anything on it until now, but uh, <laughs> uh, you see it now, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, if we start with the instance record, um, uh, a few elements have been added uh, and, and uh, uh, changed. Um, first of all, we've added uh, statistical codes uh, to, uh, to the instance records. That's a way for, for the librarians to, to tag their, uh, their records with a code for, for statistical purposes. Uh, and uh, this, uh, uh, you see it, uh, you see down here, uh, you can add any number of uh, statistical codes. Uh, this is uh, based on, uh, on control vocabularies, uh, actually on two uh, different control vocabularies. It's a sort of a hierarchical structure. Uh, so if we take a look at, at those, um, And I was supposed to be in two. So here, yeah. um, so we have the statistical code types. Um, I think it's the University of Chicago that has contributed these uh, these uh, samples. Uh, these uh, statistical code types are uh, order categories of codes that you can then uh, uh, attach to the actual uh, statistical codes. Uh, uh, that, that you that you see here, and then you can uh, attach them to uh, records uh, at uh, different levels, uh, uh, whether it's the instance, the holdings record, or the uh, the item. So in this case, we are looking at the uh, the instance record, and uh, uh, there's going to be some refinement of the way you you choose these. Uh, right now, it's a, a one select list where you have the, the category first and then, then the individual code uh, after that. It's going to be a, a sort of a two uh, 
uh, two-way uh, access to them where you can either uh, go through uh, the, the category and, and find the code through that, or you can go straight to, to, to the code. But, but that's a refinement to come. So, so that's that. Um, then we have uh, changed uh, the, uh, the structure of alternative titles. For a while we've had uh, alternative titles, but, but uh, now uh, uh, we needed a, a qualifier, so you can uh, specify what kind of uh, alternative title uh, uh, you're adding. And again, it's a, it's a new um, uh, uh, settings page or new control vocabulary with the settings page. Uh, uh, Aditya has made a lot of these uh, settings pages uh, lately uh, uh, that we of course use to sort of uh, normalize or uh, restrict what what can be entered on on the records when when you edit uh, edit it in in this view. Uh, that's pretty much it for for the instance uh, record. If we then continue to the uh, the holdings record, there are a, a, a a little more uh, additions to that uh, this time around. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, we have um, uh, the holdings uh, human uh, readable ID added. We have uh, the uh, opportunity to add one or more former holding IDs. Uh, it's intended to hold the IDs that this uh, holding record had in, in whatever source system it uh, came from. Uh, we have another control vocabulary here, uh, 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 a holdings type, uh, where you can specify what kind of holding uh, you're looking at. And then again, we have uh, the same uh, statistical codes as before that you can add on the holdings uh, level as well. Um, then uh, we, uh, or, uh, we had already a call number, but it's been extended with the prefix, suffix, and the uh, Qualifier call number type, yet another control vocabulary uh, which uh, Aditya did a, a settings page, and and we have a, a copy number. Um, in in uh, this uh, according holding detail, uh, we added uh, or rather extended the structure of the uh, holding statements. I believe we had holding statements for a while, but but uh, and now we uh, there's a uh, uh, there was a need to add notes to the holding statements, so, and there was a need to have uh, different types of, uh, of holding statements. So we have uh, now supplements, holding statement for supplements and for indexes, and for all of the, the different uh, holding statements, there's an, an option to add a note to them. Um, we've added a digitization policy, retention policy, and um, uh, which are free text fields, and then uh, Yet another control vocabulary with the settings page, I believe. Uh, yeah, it has, and uh, uh, where you can specify what uh, the IL policy is for this uh, holding. Um, then we added uh, uh, notes. Uh, I think we have seen notes before, but again, this time it's been. Uh, uh, it's more complete uh, in the sense that it now has a, a, a underlying control vocabulary that where you specify uh, or you qualify the kind of note that you're adding, and you can uh, and you can uh, uh, specify whether it's uh, public or, or for staff only. Uh, and of course, again, you can add as many uh, as you want. Um, <clears throat> uh, this was. Uh, a hard code list last time you saw it, if anybody seemed to remember that they had seen it before, uh, it probably looked pretty much the same last time, but, but now it's uh, implemented fully. Uh, and then for electronic access, that's also new, but the new thing is that, again, there is a, a control vocabulary under it to, with the settings page to specify the, uh, what kind of uh, 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 UL this is in relation to 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 the holding record, um, and then uh, we've added uh, receiving history uh, with uh, an enumeration and chronology. I'm not able to 
to to explain uh, uh, what that's about, but uh, but uh, it it's uh, it's uh, there for for the librarian to fill out, and uh, and uh, we will add an option to uh, uh, to specify how it's uh, going to be displayed, uh, whether it's going to be uh, concatenated enumeration, concatenated chronology, or uh, displayed separately. But that's uh, that is. Uh, there's something to be done. And that's it for the holdings record. We removed some stuff. Uh, so, so that was one of those uh, brain changes I talked about that uh, requires to go around to all the, the dependent modules and, uh, and update them as well. Uh, we removed uh, platforms, uh, for instance. Um, and then uh, the major change uh, since uh, last time is uh, on the item record. It was uh, pretty short before and, and it's uh, uh, extended quite a bit. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, well, it uh, has, uh, has as many fields now as, as the, the other types of records in inventory. So um, uh, we uh, added uh, all these uh, accordions both to the view and to the, ed uh, the edit form. Um, and uh, some of the data that we saw on the other levels on holdings and or instance level, uh, you, you will see again here. So no need to go into detail with, uh, with, with those. But uh, again, we added the uh, human readable ID, uh, we added accession number, uh, we had item identifier uh, and, and as for, for holdings, you can add an, a formal identifier. And uh, as for holdings and instances, you can add uh, uh, statistical codes. Uh, and again, you can have an item level uh, call number uh, uh, with all the same, um, uh, with all the same uh, pieces of information as on uh, the holdings level. Um, then we added the year and caption. Uh, and we added uh, this uh, accordion uh, where the librarian can describe the conditions of, of, the, of the, the given uh, piece or item, uh, the number of missing pieces, missing pieces, and when you uh, set this, this uh, piece of information and whether the, and there's an yet another control vocabulary, oh, it's not populated here, where you can uh, describe what the, the, the status of the item is, uh, damage status, and, and, and uh, we will set uh, the date I reckon we'll set it uh, automatically when, when it's, uh, it's updated. Uh, that would be a bad change to, to be done. Again, notes uh, you can have on, on this level as well. So uh, that's added uh, there. Um, and then we uh, made a few changes, changed the uh, piece identifiers to copy numbers and, and, and that, that sort of things, uh, things that you, you would expect, but, uh, but again, uh, things that are, are being changed, so you have to uh, make sure that all dependent modules uh, uh, are, are safe uh, regardless. And finally, we added electronic access on, on this level as well. Um, and that's that's uh, pretty much it. A lot of uh, 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 structural uh, data structure additions uh, to to all three levels of uh, main levels of uh, information in inventory. That's it for me. Great, thank you. Okay, so it looks like that's it for the core team. Uh, so let's move on now to Stripes Force. And now we have John Coburn and Rasmus. Um, yep, I can start if, um, okay. if that's okay. That sounds good. Yep. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Yes, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, cool. So uh, I'm going to do a little uh, demo of the uh, Stripes Components UI Storybook. And um, some of you guys probably already know what this is, but uh, to those who don't, 
the storybook is a UI uh, development environment that allows for developers to uh, to see which components are available within the Stripe's components library, try them out, and read the relevant uh, documentation regarding implementation, etc. So um, this provides a, a very nice way to to work on on existing components or adding new components. Uh, the, the storybook environment provides hot reloading as well as functionality that can uh, be very helpful when uh, testing out components in the browser. So um, our storybook has been a while uh, around for a while now, but uh, not all components has been listed here. Um, we are now close to having all components uh, listed in the storybook and uh, we are in the progress of adding the missing ones. So soon we should have the complete list of components and hopefully future components will be added here as well. So uh, just a quick look here. You can see here all the components listed. You can um, you can click on each component to see different examples. The the README will be shown under here, so you can see what props you can use, uh, an example of how to implement it, and uh, you can even um, you can even try it out here up in this window. Um, so uh, one of the newer components we added is the um, uh, menu section, which is here, which basically allows for composing more advanced paint header menus, whereas before we only uh, provide an option to do these simple menus, but now you can uh, use this component to divide up into actions and use other components to compose a more complex menu. So here's an example within a menu. It's a little bit buggy. There we go. So, and if you look below, uh, there are uh, examples of code and so on. So I think uh, this uh, storybook gives a, it's a very good way to see uh, what components you have at your disposal as a developer when developing UI modules and so on. And um, it's it's fairly easy to 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 start it, uh, to run the, the, the storybook. You just go to your, um, you just clone down the, the Stripes components repo and then you run the yarn storybook command. And this will, uh, within a few seconds here, it will start up the uh, the storybook, and you can open it on the URL here, in the, in your browser. Um, one more thing worth mentioning is that each uh, that storybook has these different uh, plugins. One of them is to show the README directly here, uh, but another one is, for example, knobs. But right now, this one doesn't have a knob, but this is like different settings for uh, uh, that you can attach, you can see different uh, sizes and, and so on for icon here. And then there could be different knobs for, for other components. And you can also change locales. So you can see different languages, how it looks with uh, different uh, locales. And you can change the direction here from uh, left to right. So let's just take an example here. Uh, um, I can change here so I can see how it looks. This looks pretty good. Um, and we'll be adding more uh, uh, add-ons in the future. I think one of the next ones we'll be adding is an accessibility add-on, which can uh, monitor and show you if you have any um, accessibility issues with your components. It will use the uh, X um, to uh, plug in to, to do the show. And um, yeah, uh, as I just mentioned, you can run the storybook uh, locally, which I would uh, recommend if you're developing, you can pull down the latest uh, Stripes components and run it. But um, I also upload uh, the storybook on UX, uh, uh, ux.folio.org slash storybook, where you can see it online. Um, so if you want to check it out, you can go to that URL and see. I guess it, this could be useful as well for, um, for other people, maybe designers uh, to see how like their designs has been implemented. And um, yeah, I guess it would be cool. I think uh, Jeffrey mentioned this yesterday, that it would be cool to have some kind of pipeline that uh, automatically deploys this uh, uh, the latest storybook to some URL uh, once the, the, the official Stripes components has been released. Um, but for now, you can find it here and I will upload it as frequently as I can. So unless there are any questions, I think that's it for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, John, are you going to do a demo? 
Yeah, sure, Holly, thanks. Okay. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my display here. Uh, so today I'm going to be demoing uh, some work that I've done on a, a POC for a hotkey setup uh, in the user's application. Uh, so the the hotkeys for this that I've used are, are actually a, a list of these is available in the slide deck on slide 33 there. Um, uh, I guess just a, a precursor to what I'm what I'm going to show you. We've we've chosen these hotkeys just kind of based on uh, uh, just internationalized uh, internationalization concerns uh, because uh, foreign foreign keyboards they can have a tough time uh, entering like non -num certain non numeric uh, characters. So if you have like brackets and that kind of stuff, I end up needing to make some changes to these as I as I as I went along and did this work. Um, uh, so just general upfront rule for some of these things and what we've had to go by is uh, that these things are done using alphabet keys uh, and then accessibility tells us we also need to use a modifier uh, with these. Um, as you can see, some of these are, are on the uh, uh, on PC, it'll be a con it'll be control. Uh, you can use the control modifier and on a Mac, it'll use your command key uh, for that. So if you guys get in there and get in users and try these guys out. Uh, so now uh, it's time for me to go ahead and do that for you. Uh, so for the sake of this demo, since there's not really a strong visual element, I'm actually using uh, a software that will um, that will display uh, the particular keyboard press that I do uh, on my screen. Can you all got, can you guys see me typing gibberish here? Yep. Hello. Okay, cool. So you don't have to take my word for it that I'm actually pressing these keys. <laughs> uh, so let's take a trip over to uh, Folio Snapshot. Folio Snapshot Stable, my Control-V can return, that's working well. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go into my users application. Uh, and so uh, uh, part of what makes the, the current implementation, uh, the users application has to have part of its UI and focus for these uh, to work. Uh, so if I'm, I, I just went ahead and went to users and I clicked on my, my search screen or my search bar over here, and so now uh, uh, that's fulfilled, so my hotkeys will work. And so one of the uh, first hotkeys that uh, I'll demo is just uh, creating a new user. So this is, you know, available up front in the UI right now. So I'm just going to hit Alt N, and it'll and it'll come right up. It'll pop right up to that view, nice and speedy. Um, so it, within this view, uh, I'm going to maybe tap around a bit and it's going to tell you all my tabs. So in this view, I've got accordions and we actually do have some keyboard shortcuts on these accordion sets. So you can use arrow keys actually to navigate these accordions and then uh, home and end will, uh, will navigate you to the first accordion and the last accordion uh, respectively. Uh, now, uh, and then for uh, within users, uh, you also have hotkeys uh, to expand and collapse the entire set. And uh, so this is control alt G to collapse and control alt B, uh, kind of chosen for some close proximity on the keyboard there uh, to, to expand and collapse all on these accordion sets. Uh, so this works on both the edit user page and it also works on the detail page. Uh, now uh, exiting out of this edit view is just easy as hitting escape. And this brings me right back uh, to my initial screen where I came from. So now let's go and uh, grab a user. Uh, do my search. And let's say Miss uh, Katie Santos Collins. Let's say we need to uh, change her name. So we've got a hotkey to go to the edit view. Uh, Control-Alt-E. When it's open, we'll take us right to that. 
And uh, let's say we'll tab right in. Uh, maybe uh, we got her last name wrong the first time we typed it. Uh, and maybe it just has a single L there. Uh, so we make the change, and now we have a nice hotkey for saving this edit form. Control S, and it will save and bring us right back, and our change is done. Nice. Uh, so gives us some nice, uh, uh, nice ability to really move around the UI quickly. Um, <clears throat> uh, gives us strong navigation capabilities. So, uh, so that's the first the user aspect that the user can kind of see and make use of on Folio Snapshot Stable right now. Uh, if future demos are are going to be probably to show some work on just the discoverability of these things. So instead of me having to tell you, uh, ideally we'll have a way in the UI where you can actually see uh, the hotkeys that are in use and, and kind of a nice system uh, uh, for developers to be able to set this up uh, within their own applications. Um, part of that infrastructure here, uh, the way that it's built at the component level, a developer can define a set of hotkeys uh, that could potentially be like edited or adjusted in the future, maybe through some configuration, you know, uh, that comes from the back end or through some UI, you know, for the users or, or, or tenants uh, where they can actually set up uh, their own hotkeys and override the, the basic default ones that a developer has set up. Uh, for their application. So uh, pretty nice things, nice steps uh, in productivity uh, and accessibility, and uh, we're getting there. We're getting close to having a, a completely keyboard navigable UI. <clears throat> Excellent. Cool. Uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Does anybody have questions? <laughs> I, I've got a couple, John. Um, so you said proof of concept. So is now that you've done this, would each app or for each screen or each type of record have to implement this separately or does this all flow down from Stripe somehow? So uh, I actually have a, a PR in Stripe's components. What I'm doing is uh, graduating the components that I've built for this that are currently existing within users. I'm graduating those into the shared component library. Uh, and so once that PR is, is in there and these components are, are tested, uh, they uh, then then UI modules uh, can use them, uh, and, and I've got some some pretty good documentation written. Gives an example about how I set this up uh, uh, for users, and it, it demonstrates that that top level definition, and then using them within certain views of your application within its workflows. Uh, so like if we wanted to use it for creating and editing vendor records or something, we, we would need to to have stories to implement the the keyboard shortcuts. Yes. Or mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you said proof of concept. So does that mean we should wait for a while until some of the future stuff that you're talking about is finished and we're kind of beyond proof of concept or uh, can we start doing it? sooner rather than later. So as soon as these components are within the shared library, uh, you can start using those components. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it will be within, you know, I would say point release. I mean, it's, it's pretty quick. You know, uh, uh, it's just the, there's a little bit of work that just has to be done before that's, that's actually in place. And then those components uh, will be used to uh, 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 facilitate uh, that discoverability aspect, you know, being able to uh, to display the actual hotkey commands to users uh, uh, and having having a nice way to kind of set that up. <clears throat> cool. It looks good. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I have one small question. It's about uh, uh, it would be the way uh, to see uh, all the shortcut uh, defined for in the application uh, some somehow. 
right and so that yeah and that's that's what we definitely want for the next layer of this is to give uh give developers a, a good ui you know or a good way to just uh access the commands that have been set uh, without having to look at the code so you can actually see them you know uh, make those actually visible uh within the ui um uh, but it. yeah, that, that aspect is still a work in progress on these. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Cool. All right, I'm going to uh, stop my share now. Okay, it looks like we have one more demo. Um, ERM, Ian? Hello. Hi, Ian. For anybody who's still here, it's, uh, I was going to thank the warmer packs, but I'd be surprised if there's anybody left in the room at this stage. Well, we there's have 14 more eight. minutes left. <laughs> okay. So they should still be here. We're excited for this <laughs> we have 58 participants. Yeah, there's 58 people, so. I'm it's expecting that heckle. crowd. Heckles, that's what I want. Oh, you want uh, a heckle? Okay. Okay, let me see. Can you, uh, can you see my desktop there? Yep. Awesome. Okay, uh, so quickly I'll go through licenses first. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and two caveats. The things I'm showing are versions of things which went into the Q4 release spreadsheet, but these are not yet in the demo system. So I'm demoing from my local system, uh, thus breaking one of the cardinal rules of the sprint review, I think. So apologies for that. Um, <laughs> and we'll, we'll get to the other stuff as, as we come to it. Um, so licenses. As you can see, this is a tool for uh, libraries to upload the licenses under which they're accessing electronic content and to be able to analyze those licenses and provide um, key license properties that help people understand what the license does or doesn't enable or what it precludes. A major part of this that isn't done yet is the attachment of actual license documents. And so we see uh, quite a lot of um, link up with the file upload functionality that's coming where you'll actually be able to upload your pdf licenses but right now this app majors on the license description um, and then we have this license properties area majority of the work in the last sprint has been around the license properties so license properties are user extensible collections of, of data that explain some aspect of the license. Uh, so can I use items under this license in IRL, for example? Can I include them in course packs? We have a new license form, but currently our use cases tend to be more, I've got this collection of uh, 50 licenses, I need to bulk load them. So we're actually bulk loading this. And again, I think that we see some pretty strong um, use cases where we'll be able to use the new file upload feature. And if I very quickly look at uh, what's on the screen currently is actually coming from this file. So you can see we define um, a yes, no property. So this is very uh, similar to what we've seen earlier on with control vocabularies. Here I'm defining a control vocabulary called yes, no other with three possible values. And then I'm defining some properties that I might use to analyze my licenses. So you can see here's the ILL property, for example, and the ILR property takes three values, yes, no, or other. And we can we have an extensible set of control vocabularies and properties that can be assigned to licenses. Um, and that's where this app is currently. Um, we're gonna do some more work on editing license properties in the next sprint. That's the direction we're heading. Um, and this is quite important because users quite often want to know for a particular electronic resource what we're able to do with that resource and this is the basis of that work. So that's UI licenses uh, backed by mod licenses. The other piece of work is the ERM module itself which is split into agreements and e-resources. Agreements are like a folder that you put on your desk and you can create uh, or you can store all the information related to a particular agreement with a particular vendor in that folder. So a list of content, the license under which you're making that content available. Um, there's been a fair amount of work. Mark Deutsch has been doing sterling work on, on this uh, in the, the last sprint. You can see the, the resources which are attached to an agreement, but the real meat of this app comes under the e-resources tab where I can see um, 
all the e-resources that I potentially might have access to and all the e-resources that I do have access to. So if I do a, a search for cancer there, um, we can see clinical cancer drugs and you can see that for clinical cancer drugs, it's currently listed in two agreements. And as it happens, both these agreements are current for me. So in a real life scenario, this would be telling me that I might even be paying for something twice and I might not need to do that. Um, or of course, it might be that these two agreements give me different license terms. So the reason that I've got access to this resource two different ways is quite legitimate. Yeah. If I take um, access to a, a different title, let me try and find one I don't currently have an agreement for. There we go. Um, I can, if I wanted to buy the uh, access to Open Cancer Immunology Journal, I've got a couple of options. I might be able to, I might be buying titles individually or I might be buying a whole package of things. And what you can see on the screen is that for the instance record, the Open Cancer Immunology Journal, over on the right side, uh, I've got two options for buying this. The source EBSCO means that this record actually came from EKB. So this is, EKB happens to know about a package called Bentham Science Complete that this title appears in. And I might actually want to add that package to an agreement um, essentially so that I can pay for access. So I've clicked on uh, add to basket there. I should say we had meetings last week and a lot of this is up for change now. Uh, so this is a little bit in flux, but this is released uh, for the test system. So this is how it is currently. I can review my current shopping basket. And the idea is that e-resource librarians might be evaluating several sources for where you could get a title from. I might be building up a title list that I want to action as a bulk thing, uh, but I'm going to take this one and I'm going to create a new agreement on it. Uh, so here's Bentham Science. And, oh, I'm rushing now, you see. 2018-01-01, and it's going to end 2020-01. No cancellation deadline status. We're going to say draft renewal priority for review, we're going to leave is perpetual and then create agreement. And you can see here's my Bentham Science Agreement now. Um, if I now go back to my e-resources tab and search for cancer, I forget which uh, it was Open Cancer Immunology Journal, wasn't it? Uh, you can see that this is now appearing as something I've got access to. And so the idea is the kind of inquiries that libraries might deal with is, hey, I had access to the Open Cancer Immunology Journal last week. Why has my access disappeared? And you can come to this screen and you can see the agreements which are going to make something available. According to this agreement, I should definitely have access right now. So I'm probably going to use my vendors app to find the contact details for the person I should shout at and say, why has my access to this thing disappeared? Um, a few other things uh, just worth showing while I'm in here. Um, search for site. Um, our users were really keen that this screen showed title level data, instance level data, and package level data. So if I scroll down here, I can see INSI. Uh, and this is a package which has come from the GoKB system. So this is a German uh, package. And you can see all the titles in the package. So here, things in this list have two very different displays over on the right. This is a package display, whereas current nano science is uh, obviously an instance level display. And I can see over here, all the different options I've got for where I might be able to buy that from. Um, I think that that is uh, the other thing that's worth saying. Mod ERS, sorry, Mod Agreements, which sits behind this, also now participates in codex searches. So if you have your codex switched on and you search for items which are selected, then this item would be returned by that. And if you search for items which are not selected, you'll get instant data from the whole list. And the last thing I'll talk about is instances in this list are restricted to electronic items, but actually the module knows about print items because it turns out that one of the ways that people will tell you about electronic items is saying, I happen to, I'm offering you the electronic item, 
but I'm referring to it by the ISSN of the print version of something. So we actually know about, for example, the print version of this journal, if, if there is a print version, uh, but we filter those lists. So this is very much about e-resources at the moment. An active conversation though is whether or not agreements should be able to have print items in them. And I think we're heading in that direction. That's ERM as it is at the moment. Any, any questions or thoughts? Is it possible to access the demo you have here somewhere? Um, this is on my laptop. I'm very hopeful that this will appear in one of the test systems very soon, um, but that's above my pay grade. Okay. Thanks. Was that Philip? Yeah. Uh, I will arrange for you to have access to this. Thanks. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for any of the people who did demos? Okay. So let me, um, we have four minutes left. Let me share my screen again here. Uh, Oh, I suppose I wanted to share it from. Okay. Okay, so there's the shortcut. Okay, so then um, our next sprint really doesn't start until the 24th. Uh, we actually did the sprint review a week early. Um, and this sprint is gonna run for three weeks because of the, the holiday that's, in, that's coming up. Um, and then our Q4 release uh, is going out on the 14th. Or is, uh, I don't know if you want to say going out, but it's uh, finished on the 14th. And then uh, by coincidence, our next two week sprint starts on the 14th and runs until the 25th. Um, and then uh, I think you all have access to the um, slide deck. We've sent the, the link out a few times so you can see uh, what are the upcoming plans for the other teams. Um, so we have quite a, quite a bit going on. Um, we finished quite a bit of what Chalmers needed, needs for their uh, go live uh, date, but we still have uh, more that needs to be done that is planned for Q1. Um, some, some of the teams have already finished that work, but some have uh, more work that needs to be done. Um, and I, I just found out today that the Q4 release will include um, some ERM uh, work for the first time. So congratulations. Um, does anybody have any questions or uh, final comments? Okay, well, uh, congratulations to everybody on um, the completion of Q4, a little early I know, but, um, uh, and thank you for the demos that you did and uh, enjoy your holiday time. <laughs>